Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April 16th edition of the Scientific Governance and Risk Meeting. My name is Richard Brown. I am uh, the Interim Governance Facilitator. Uh, today, we're going to hear from uh, Vishesh, who's going to give us a state of the pegs, possibly uh, long for wisdom. I hadn't given him a heads up, but maybe he'll do governance at a glance. And we are going to hear from Charles St. Louis as we dig into uh, myth zero, the biggest myth of all. Um, this is going to be an important discussion because uh, we are um, getting more sophisticated and process is uh, is being uh, brought to the table and it's going to change the way that things work um, if the community ratifies these things. Uh, and we're going to be existing in a world that's different than the one we are in right now uh, soon. Uh, time is rapidly approaching. Um, so uh, the, the General idea is at some point in May, we're going to flip over into a, a more mythified governance uh, cadence. And that requires, um, that requires, uh, sorry, I gave you chats and getting bombed in three different windows. Um, that requires uh, a, a, a rethink or a shift in the way that we do things. And so Charles is going to give us um, a refresher on what MIP Zero is all about and how that. Um, has implications for the way that we, we govern the ecosystem and how we interact with each other. That's going to be a big uh, discussion, so I'm not going to use up a lot of time. What I do want to talk about is um, uh, me. Let's talk about me for a second. Um, so I, I have a lot of different hats at MakerDAO. One of those hats um, that's more relevant to this uh, community or this group is um, one of the interim governance facilitator. Um, and uh, the interim governance facilitator uh, has a fairly sophisticated mandate associated with that role, which is in the forums, and I'll post a link to it in a second. Um, but uh, what I want to focus on is that key uh, part of that title, and that key part is interim. Um, the, the way that we, we develop things in this, this venue here, and MakerDAO kind of as a whole, this is, this is one of our models, is that um, we need to decentralize and we need to uh, refine and build out this protocol so we can uh, hand it to the community um, and the community can, can take the reins and we can all sit back and enjoy the fruits of our labor after it's over. Um, uh, in order to do that, we need to, or it's our opinion that we need to bootstrap um, parts of the ecosystem. So we create these refer reference implementations, come up with ideas that we think are good, uh, provide uh, resources and funding and frameworks around those um, uh, um, uh, groups of actors or tooling or uh, e uh, parts of the ecosystem, basically. Um, and once it's up and running and been refined and thought about and revised and edited, then the next step is to um, begin to find people who can assume those responsibilities for us or with us. And uh, I think that we're there. So this is uh, super exciting for me. And so I've posted a, a thread in the forums about uh, uh, me uh, nominating uh, the first uh, truly community sourced governance facilitator. And I think that uh, many people who've been paying attention to this ecosystem will not, it was one kind of a surprise. I think that long for wisdom, there's, there's no better uh, person who can step up and assume uh, a leadership role in the governance ecosystem than him. He's, I, I, I give him tons of um, really embarrassing compliments and, and uh, praise in that forum thread. So I encourage everybody to take a look at it and please uh, consider some of my, my, uh, my arguments for expanding the role that I currently occupy and formalizing uh, and rewarding and recognizing some of or the, the incredible amount of hard work that Long has been doing uh, over the last, who even knows how long. It feels like years, but it's probably months. Uh, he's really stepped up and done a fantastic job. And I, I think that personally, I think that um, it's impossible to find somebody who would better represent the needs of the community uh, than, than Long for Wisdom. So please have a look at that forum thread uh, and uh, let the community know what you think. I think that long did I sufficiently embarrass you? I can I can heap more praise on you publicly if, if you like. No, I think you were very thorough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's one of the things I love about complimenting Long for Wisdom is he does not like it. Yeah. 
makes it all the sweeter. So we'll leave it there. Um, uh, actually, well, no, I should give you an opportunity. Long, do you want to say anything? Or do you, do you have a speech prepared or a presentation? Uh, I don't have a speech or presentation prepared. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I sort of answered on that, on that thread and sort of said I would respond in a couple of days. Um, so like, yeah, I guess just keep an eye out for that. Um, in general, the fact that you're nominating me, Rich, is very gratifying, so thank you. Um, uh, I think we just had a moment. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you, Long. Uh, to, to be serious, though, like, uh, I, I could not possibly be happier with the, the, the level of, of work that you, you put into the ecosystem and the diligence and, and deep thought and uh, idealism that comes along with your work. So uh, there's... there. I, I built out governance ecosystems in different organizations uh, in uh, my uh, long and checkered past. Um, and I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody that has the same chops as long careerism. So uh, Maker is, is fantastically lucky to have a resource like this available to us. So I am uh, extremely look, uh, happy and looking forward to um, not being all alone in the governance facilitator world and, then, and watching this, this role develop as he, he puts his own stamp on it. And, we eventually increase the number of governance facilitators to uh, uh, increase the throughput of this of this one. So I'm going to leave it there um, and possibly uh, move on with the agenda at this point, I think. Um, actually, did somebody, are there any questions? Cyrus, did you have a question you would like to ask me? Just wondering, is this an additional governance facilitator role or is it yeah. a replacement of the current governance facilitator? It's uh, uh, in addition uh, with an eye to eventually some point in the future replacing. So the, the, with these uh, interim roles and this bootstrapping process and this establishing like the, the norm and then uh, moving into the handoff phase, uh, I, I talked about this in the original mandate that it's my hope that we, um, after the interim governance facilitator, um, we all understand what that actually means or what a governance facilitator is. Um, the next step is to onboard people from the community to begin assuming those same responsibilities. And then we uh, have a team of governance facilitators and that team expands to begin addressing uh, needs that we haven't really spoken about that much, but um, need to be addressed like um, having governance facilitators in uh, other parts of the world uh, that have deeper insight into other demographics. So. Why don't we have one for the Latin American market? Why don't we find a governance facilitator for APAC region? Why don't we, like the list goes on, right? Um, there's enough work to go around. Um, so my hope is that at some point we have two, three, four governance facilitators. And once that, that machine is up and running, then uh, the foundation can take a step back out of that role and then the community can, can, can own it completely. That's the goal. All right, um, I am going to hand it off to Long for Wisdom, I think. So uh, actually, I, I asked you rhetorically at the top, did you have a governance at a glance that you wanted to go over today? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I'll hand it off. I write it, I write it every week, so you can either go over it or not. So. Let's do it. Uh, cool. Uh, all right, so active discussions this week. Um, it's sort of difficult to split into different threads, but discussion on the MIPS has continued. Um, so the initial um, 13 maker improvement, pro improvement proposals. Um, MIP 0 and MIP 3 have attracted some of the most feedback. Um, cool, we've also had, um, we've had a, a new member to the forum, um, Fourth Street, uh, create a post regarding confidence in the PEG, um, which is something that probably, probably should be discussed um, more. I know. I know a bunch of people have been discussing it generally. Um, but uh, so this user sort of comes in sort of urging more sort of um, aggressive action to fix the bug, um, which I think is something we should maybe be considering um, alongside the current um, strategies we're employing. Um, well, I have a question for you here, and maybe you can't answer it, but um, that, that we're seeing the same. Uh, conversations arise in the subreddit. Um, and one of the interesting yeah. things I've noticed is that um, 
their strong opinions that the peg must be fixed. Uh, that's a universally understood and accepted truth. Um, but the solutions seem to be diametrically opposed frequently. Um, we have to do X yeah. and then uh, another thread shows up and says we cannot ever do X or we'll never restore the peg. So is there a consensus forming in the, in the forums or is it uh, still sort of? No, I don't think there's, I don't think there's much consensus there right yet. Like from my perspective, from my perspective, we've done most of the, well, basically all of the short term things we can, right? Like the other things we need to do are kind of just like wait and onboard collateral and um, things of that nature or like super long term, like um, you like change the, to the protocol, like negative rates or some other system, which allows us to um, like inject liquidity into the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I don't know that there's any consensus, um, but I think it's something we need to be discussing because we haven't seen much change in the last few weeks. Uh, cool. Anyway, to continue, um, so we've also had um, the discussion Will created, um, I think eight days ago now, um, discussing revisiting the GSM delay and the dark spell social layer discussion, um, which is a fairly big deal, um, but is obviously quite complicated and is going to require quite a lot of work to actually figure out. Um, cool. So moving on to consensus seeking. Um, as mentioned, um, Will's investigating updating the GSM delay. Um, so he's created a signal request for that. Um, so questioning whether we um, set it back to 24 hours or we keep it at four hours or we go somewhere in between. Um, so if you have opinions on that, I would suggest you share them in that thread. Um, Derek's opened a signal request around the grace period between when we trigger shutdown and when shutdown actually occurs, I think is if I'm understanding, if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, basically defining if we want to set like a delay for, before it actually happens so that ecosystem participants have time to to do the final things they need to do and can be sort of confident of a fixed date. Because um, obviously it's difficult to define a, def a fixed date when we're, depend when we're relying on the executive to pass through DSG. So, if we sort of like set a date in that executive, as long as it passes at some point before that date, we can be fairly sure that it's gonna, that there won't be any unexpected things happening for people. Um, and finally, it's just worth mentioning um, the signal thread Joshua created um, to compensate, to signal whether we compensate vault holders um, based on the events of Black Thursday has passed. Um, I think it was about 60,000 make it to 30,000. So that doesn't, we haven't defined any details yet. We don't really know what we're doing, um, but that's an interesting um, note for how, what make all this. Do you get a sense that the community has aligned on a path forward or, uh, so I, I had a fair, actually this is an interesting discussion too, because I, uh, in the, we're talking about governance facilitators and I, I don't know how long I've occupied this role and I've never actually exercised any real power associated with it. Um, until uh, the, the second in the string of polls associated with the governance, I'm sorry, the compensation uh, strategy. Um, it, it had deviated uh, significantly from established norms and signaling guidelines and all the rest. And so I asked uh, the community or that sort of ad hoc working group to um, collect kind of a plan of how they wanted to address things next so we can start dividing up those polls and get this, this, this show on the road. Does it feel like there's alignment there? Is there a group of people formed to you know, solve this problem or are we waiting for more discovery? I think that, or is, is it all on Maker Man at this point? Not, not to yeah, throw so the spotlight on anybody? Things may be going, going on that I'm not aware of, but my understanding is Maker Man is working on um, doing an analysis of the auctions, um, like generally and specifically to Black Thursday. Um, I don't think anyone's like drastically objected to you to stopping the second poll. Um, so I don't think there's like widespread outrage or anything. Um, yeah, that's good. Well, this, the second, yeah, so the second poll, just to be clear was, so the first poll was um, significant. Um, is compensation a good idea? Does, does the community want to do it? Yes or no? And the answer is yes, that's, that's a big decision. Um, very cool to watch happen. The second poll was uh, what denomination should that uh, compensation be in? Um, and that's, that's where I felt like we've gone from macro to uh, very micro 
almost immediately. And if we go down that road, there's going to be uh, a lot of micro polls showing up. So it's my hope that the uh, the community can align on sort of a working group to uh, establish the stakeholders, figure out what the plan is, come up with next steps, and then we can, uh, as an ecosystem, sort of divide up what uh, what decision making processes need to go along with that. Um, Maker Man, you made a comment. Do you want to say anything on video or audio? Uh, well, I pretty much said it in the thread. I kind of ran into a small hitch. I don't know if uh, C. Mooney can talk about this or not. Uh, that's kind of slowed it down, but my analysis should be complete by the weekend. I'm hoping to post it maybe Sunday, Monday latest. Then we can thrash through it on Tuesday. Uh, my issues are kind of defining what we call Black Thursday and compensation. You know, do you do it with the first start of a zero bid auction and the last end or what? Uh, and then kind of running the scenario analysis for compensation, sort of at what level and how. The money, you know, doing it in die is kind of a lot harder to think about and digest than just to do it in F. And so I'm going to do it in F, and then I'm going to let it just wait for the poll to thrash out. And then uh, it's going to be hard because if you can't see what the numbers are and die, or at least we have to wrap our hands around it, uh, I don't know how we can vote on it that way. And so I have a real issue with defining this in terms of like USD or die, whereas F is pretty clean. And then it's just a matter of like defining the time frame. But like I said, other than the hitch that I reported to the to C. Mooney, which I think has made its way to the Maker Foundation just something I discovered in this analysis. Um, that's it. So just kind of, I got my data set. I'm kind of ready to go through it. I was pretty much up all last night, kind of taking the data I had, putting it together and getting it set for the final rifle through and kind of doing the consistency checks on it to make sure that it looks right. I have a couple missing vault numbers. They don't look substantial. So, but otherwise this should be pretty clean. Um, and I'm just going to focus on kind of this whole zero bid, and then I'm going to include as a contrast of Vault 2288 and whatever other vaults I can pick out to as a as a uh, comparison of a guy who actually self liquidated and kind of through I think it was DeFi Saver or whatever that uh, gives you a kind of handle as a comparison. Like if you did this yourself, what would you have gotten? And so there's at least one of those, or maybe more. So that's it on my side. Uh, thanks for the awesome. Idea. That's awesome. And thanks again for all the work that you've done on that. It's really appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's the end of my segment, Rich. Just leave it. All right. Uh, thanks, man. Uh, so, uh, as I said at the top of the call, we have a lot uh, of things to dig into in the WIPS world, and I'm going to immediately hand it over to Charles and allow him to give us some context and launch into the presentation. Thanks, Rich. So before I actually get started with the presentation, I just wanted to share a couple of links. Uh, so this, I'm going to share the GitHub link to MIP0. The discourse form link, which may be a little outdated because as I'll get into, the MIPs are in the request for comment phase, which means that the MIP authors work with the uh, community members and iterate on the feedback from them to change the MIPs before they can actually get ratified. So there may be a couple differences and I'll mention the main ones throughout the presentation. And for those of you who haven't had the chance to go through the MIPs, I'm gonna post the, the forum post that showed the 13 initial MIPs. Okay. So now I can share my screen. All right, so for, well, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Charles St. Louis and I work at the Maker Foundation on the engineering general team. I've been responsible for uh, the research and architecting and formalizing of maker governance on behalf of the foundation. Uh, so before I get started with the presentation, I wanted to provide a brief overview of what it will entail. So I'm going to give an introduction to 
the self-sustaining maker initiative. Not too many details, just kind of a recap. Then I'll introduce the, the MIPS framework itself. I'll walk through MIP zero. And lastly, I'll provide a timeline update on what, what's to come in the next couple of weeks. So we officially kickstarted the self-sustaining maker initiative approximately 15 days ago. And then Rune went on to the following governance call and talked about the three pillars of a self-sustaining DAO. So these three pillars are what long run governance will need and what will eventually make MakerDAO self-sustainable. So these three core pillars are the elected pay contributors and domain teams. Think of it as the, the decentralized workforce serving the DAO. Maker improvement proposals, which are the way to affect change that both EPCs and domain teams will use as well as community members to both maintain and improve the protocol and governance. Then lastly, there's vote delegates, which you can think of as politicians. So serving the broader community's needs and helping them make the best decisions possible for the DAO. And with all these key pillars in place, we'll reach the position of implementing the first governance paradigm and be on our way of actually having a self-sustaining DAO. So with that, I'm gonna go over the MIPS framework. So I like to say that the MIPS framework is a tool to provide a clear, transparent process that allows maker governance to adapt and evolve the maker protocol over time based on needs and opportunities that arise. MIPS zero structure is there's a preamble, which is kind of like an administrative thing. It, it also helps with the management of long-term MIPS and all those things. I'll go through the structure of it after. There's the summary, which gives a brief overview of what this MIP is for. Then there's the motivation on why, why it's needed in general. And lastly, the most important part is the specification, which is the proposal details. So what you're actually proposing, if it's a technical MIP, uh, the code, including the executive code that will be needed to implement it if it does get ratified. So this general structure is standard across all the initial MIPs that we proposed, as well as the general template. So we'll get into the general template later as well, but you'll see that this is the way that community members can um, use and draft new proposals for review. So MIP zero's preamble has a few things. So it highlights the MIP number, which is assigned by the MIP editor after the conception phase. Uh, there's the title, brief overview of what, it, what it's for, the authors, the type, the status, so as of now, it's in the request for comments phase, which means that there's a review period dedicated to iterating on it based on both feedback from the community and the MIP author's general opinions. The data was initially proposed and then dependencies. So in MIP zero's case, there are no dependencies, um, but for example, in the collateral onboarding MIP set, a lot of the MIPs are reliant on each other. So you, you then indicate which ones kind of work together or are dependent on each other. Now, lastly, there's a section for replacement. Um, in many cases, some MIPS may become obsolete over time or they aren't really um, in progress or being used. So you can create a new MIP uh, to replace that with updated information, updated processes, and then you'd be indicating which one you'd like to replace. So MIP zero, the summary. So it's the Genesis proposal and it describes the MIPS framework. So all the core components and statuses, as well as the various MIP types, and most importantly, the overall MIPS cycles. So from the, sec from the second it was created up until it's ratified or ultimately rejected. It also provides the tools such as MIP templates, uh, processes, and also pretty critical, it, it describes the roles of the framework. So the necessary roles that it needs to operate and uh, be maintained. So that's the MIP editor and the governance facilitator. It also highlights how they can be elected and removed. So what's the motivation behind MIP zero? As mentioned, the self-sustaining initiative um, is making MakerDAO evolve into an organization that is fully decentralized and self-sustainable. So in order to further this, we need maker and improvement proposals to help govern the system. Overall, the purpose is to open up the ability to improve maker governance in the protocol to anyone in the community. 
and by empowering the community members to do this. Uh, the goal is that we can make MakerDAO that much closer to self-sustainability. So these are the components of MIP0. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the first one um, because you can kind of just read through them in general, but they do help provide a lot of context for specific words that are used throughout uh, the entire initial 13 MIPS um, in terms of language and um, how they all relate. Then we have the core principles. There were initially three, but as part of the request for comments phase, uh, Long for Wisdom proposed two other ones, which I'll get into. Then there's the MIP life cycle, which is very important. It highlights uh, nine main, main, main steps that a MIP needs to go through before it becomes ratified or I guess rejected. Then we'll talk, then it covers the components and the component types. So that's basically what you're looking at. These components uh, break down the core specification of the actual MIP itself. And it can also be used for um, adding technical types of proposals within them. Then the component five is the replacement process. So how you go about replacing a MIP. Then MIP six is the templates. And then lastly, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 are the domain rule dependencies that the framework will rely upon for support as well as how to elect and remove them. So the core principles of the MIPS framework are specificity. It's important that MIPS are very specific to one single behavior responsibility. Um, it also kind of um, works into the third one, which is of avoiding overlap. But basically if a MIP has to define too many different things, it should be broken up into multiple ones. Next is completeness. So a MIP or MIP set um, has to have all the appropriate parts to cover a whole behavior and it has to be um, it has to make sense in its entirety. So you can't have two MIPS explaining a full process or a MIP set that doesn't explain a whole behavior behind it. So if you look at the collateral onboarding process, it needs to have all the components that someone can use to get a collateral successfully onboarded to the, to the protocol or else it is not complete. Third is to avoid overlap. I think that's uh, quite self-explainable. Um, next is clarity and brevity. So these are the ones that Long for Wisdom proposed. So a MIP needs to be very clear and use clear language so as many people as possible can understand it. And lastly, brevity. Um, it's important to make these as short as possible because we don't want people to uh, start reading and then leave and not provide any feedback or maybe not even vote on the proposal in the long run. So the MIPS life cycle. These are the nine steps that a MIP would go through before being ratified. Uh, due to the interest of time, I, I, I summarized them. And there are a lot more details that you can find in, in the, the GitHub page or the form that actually talk about the criteria these st stages and statuses need to meet before they can move on to the next one. So the first is the conception. So this is when a MIPS life begins and it's proposed to make a form as well as a PR on, on the GitHub repo. Next, the MIP editor goes in and makes sure that it conforms to the, the, the standardized template and meets all requirements, kind of checks to see if all of those are good. And then you give the stamp of approval. Next is the current phase that we're actually in right now. So it's a request for comments. It's a formal review period, um, including um, review from the community and further drafting, but it is important to note that the ultimate edits are completely dependent on whether the MIP author actually wants to do it. And I mean, if they don't accept the community's feedback, it's ultimately up to governance to decide if they like it or not. So that's an important thing to note. The fourth status is if it fulfills the feedback period. So a MIP has a dedicated feedback period that um, can range for X amount of time. In many cases, it's three months. And then there's also a frozen period where the MIP can't go under any more changes and it's there for people to digest. Oh, by the way, I'll answer some questions at the end. And also I'd like, due to the interest of time, a lot of the questions, um, I'd like to be directed to the forum or on GitHub if you have suggestions. 
Anyway, the next step in the process is formal submission. So this is when the MIP author actually completes the edits and submits it formally to the governance cycle in which the governance facilitator would have to kind of make sure that it meets all the checks and requirements before it should officially be submitted to the governance cycle. And if it is rejected, it can be submitted at a later date um, unless there's any malicious or other behavior that would dictate otherwise. Then the MIP actually enters the governance cycle in which a few different processes would occur. So there'd be um, inclusion poll and a a governance poll and then the executive vote. So in, in many ways, the executive vote is the, the final stamp on whether this MIP should be ratified, but a lot, a lot of the reasoning and justification for this proposal will happen before that. So it'll kind of just be like that final, like yes or no. And then lastly, if the MIP does get accepted, it's granted the status. Um, this is more of helping maintain and manage the MIPs overall and organize them more effectively. So we mentioned the MIP components of each MIP. And so basically highlights and breaks down what the contents of are, what they are. And the MIPs can have multiple components. As you can see here, there's 11. Um, it helps satisfy completeness and readability. So there are different types of components. You can have technical components in which there would be code proposed or subproposals um, that would be proposed. And as you can see, the way the components are labeled are with the MIPS, MIP number, and then component number. So the MIP replacement process. So a MIP can define one, one or more replacement targets in its preamble. Um, so if the MIP is given that accepted status, the replacement target is actually deemed effectively obsolete and that MIP becomes inactive. So the replace MIP will actually list in its document what it would replace to. So if that MIP does get replaced, it would have to, the new MIP it's replacing would have to redirect to all the ones that it, it depends on um, to make it more clear for people to follow. I also did, I didn't mention, but there are a few other statuses that MIPs can take. There's the withdrawal status, there's obsolete. Um, the withdrawal is if the MIP author deems that he doesn't want to continue at this point the MIP can eventually become obsolete or another willing community member can pick it up and uh, finish the, the work there. And that transition process is done uh, with the support of the MIP editor. The sixth component is MIP templates. So there's three main ones that I, I want to cover. There's the general MIP template, there's the technical MIP template, and then subproposals. The general MIP, MIP template is what MIP zero is using and it has the preamble, the summary, motivation, and specification. Now the technical MIP template is practically the exact same thing, although the specification has a few other key um, elements that need to be included. So this is the proposed code, which includes the executive code that would need to be used to um, affect that change. There's test cases, security considerations, which are very important and it, you can be as thorough as you want with the security considerations, but it does help when you can kind of be proactive in assuming what could go wrong with the introduction or implementation of a, a technical solution, um, such as including if it's backwards compatible or not. Then there's the auto information and the auto report. So with a technical solution, it's really important that the code is audited and that it's provided to the public to see as a report. And lastly, if the code is is needed to have a license, you'd include the, the required license there. Next is the subproposals. So a subproposal is an instance of a subprocess that has been defined in a specific MIP. You can think of it as a, like a mini process that um, can be used uh, to onboard new things um, or remove in many cases. So the subproposal component um, is actually used within this, this MIP itself for both electing the MIP editor and governance facilitator and also removing them. And as you can see, they are formally named by the MIP number, the component, and then SP number. 
Lastly, we're going to get into the details of the domain roles that the MIPS framework depend on. It's the MIP editor and the governance facilitator. So the MIP editor enforces the administrative and editorial aspects of the overall MIPS framework and processes that it has. And the expectation is that it will start out with an interim editor, um, which I will propose myself as in next week. And then others will join from the community as we progress through, much like the governance facilitator uh, processes that Rich described before this presentation started. And in terms of the MIPS framework, the governance facilitator um, works with the governance cycle and operates voting front ends, uh, runs meetings, works with the MIP editor to accept MIPS and make sure that they're ready to go into the governance cycle itself and so on. So I didn't want to take up too much time with going over how the domain roles are elected and removed. They are um, fairly well laid out within the document itself. But these are the components that detail the removal processes and the election processes for both these roles. Um, they're, they're quite similar. The template is, is used for both of them is pretty much repeated other than the title of them. So lastly, I wanna provide a timeline on what's gonna happen with the MIPS framework and the MIPS over the next two weeks. So the request for comments phase will continue until the 27th, um, which is what I'd like to take a little moment to tell you guys is I'd really appreciate any edits or further feedback. There's a lot on the forums. Um, I've been working with Long for Wisdom, especially on making the edits. Um, I know a lot of you have some strong opinions. So if you do have some time, please continue to do that. The next update is I'm gonna submit my, my sub-proposal, proposing myself as the MIP editor on April 21st, next Tuesday. And the Maker Foundation smart contract team uh, will create a sub-proposal for the smart contract domain team on the, the 22nd or approximately around then. The other two sub-proposals are the general risk model by the uh, risk team and um, any Oracle onboarding sub-proposals. So these will all happen before the 27th. Now on April 27th, a special governance poll will occur and it's called a timing vote. So the timing vote will have two options to pr proceed with the ratification governance poll uh, of the 13 proposed MIPS that we've all been reviewing or to delay the ratification for one month and then in institute a time period for competing proposals to be submitted by the community members. So if the timing poll does resolve to proceed, the governance poll to ratify them officially would occur over May 1st to 4th. And if that ratification vote does resolve to yes, the first governance cycle would begin on May 4th and the and we'd be off to the races. And if you do want to have more details on what the other options are, if the, de, the if the ratification is delayed for one month, you can reference it in MIP0. I just didn't have enough space in the slide to detail it. So that was a lot of information, but I am done now. And if there are any brief questions that anyone has, I'd be happy to answer them if we have time. Otherwise, please go to the forums or the Rocket Chat channel. It's just MIPS. And um, I look forward to hearing from all of you. I have a, one question about timeline rather than content, if that's yeah. adequate. Um, so I notice you mentioned the smart contracts team were gonna do a sub-proposal to, to onboard themselves as like officially. Do we need to do sub proposals for the risk, like the risk team as well, like like to like ratify them under the MIPS process, or are we like just assuming that they're they are ratified already and they don't need to be like confirmed or anything? So as of now, I I mean, we could go either way. I mean, the risk team has officially proposed their self as the uh, risk team to the public. As long as well as the governance facilitator of like Rich himself, yeah. so um, it's kind of one of those hand wavy things. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, as as you know, I'm not a fan of hand wavy things, but like, <laughs> I'm just I'm just kind of worried because there's going to be like a like a sub proposal for the for the smart contracts team onboarding, and that's going to go in the MIPS repository presumably and like exist forever. Like, do we want like the like the paper trail? I guess for like the other teams. But like there's there's a list of ratified teams in one of the MIPS, right? Like in I forget which one it is. Sorry. Yeah. Um, like, do we just add the currently ratified teams to that, like, 
on like you know as we ratify it or yeah so there's we, th yeah. there's two ways we could do it we could add the already currently ratified ones the governance facilitator the risk team to the list prior by making a change before april 27th or we could submit sub proposals to actually ratify them through the most process themselves it's i guess we can just base it on uh, community feedback and general consensus Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, Will, you had a question in the side part. Did you want to ask that on mic? Or should I read that out for you? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, uh, if I got that right from the, from the proposals there. Um, but there was, a, there was the mention, it was specifically for the risk team proposals. And um, and I, I just want to clarify what I understood right uh, around the counter proposals, I think, because uh, if the, the risk team kind of like submitting like a, a risk model or general risk model or just like a risk model for a particular asset, and then the counter proposal needs to happen within um, uh, an X period of time, I was just thinking, well, I, I haven't seen a lot of people actually producing a risk model in, in two weeks. Um, but and but I, I was just not sure whether that was the kind of proposal that that was taken into account, or was just the proposal of including some uh, new risk team as part of the mix. It wasn't a little bit uncertain there, the way that it was phrased. So I just wanted to clarify what the model uh, uh, risk modeling comes under that as well. Under those timelines, um, for trials. Yeah. So when I when I was speaking to the competition proposals, so yeah, if the timing vote does say that we want to delay the ratification vote of the the MIPS, uh, community members can propose anything that's directly competing with one of the thirteen MIPS and provide it as an alternative for the community to choose between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, the general risk model sub proposal. I mean, you can do a competition proposal, but it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, during this period of time. I mean, it, like after the MIPS framework is in place, there's many risk models that can be proposed. It's just up to the community in general to decide if they want to use it or not. Um, I'm, Cyrus might also be able to cover some answers there. So I think the idea is um, MIP 11 allows a template for any new risk team to essentially apply to be as a risk team and submit whatever methodology they have for evaluating assets and then pending approval from the community of such a risk model they could then um, they could then propose um, asset evaluations risk parameters whatever for for any asset they want of course in conjunction with what the community wants. And then if there's competing assets or competing risk teams for the, for the same asset, then that shouldn't really be a problem. The community would just essentially select, select one or the other. So I wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, it, yeah. I think kind of like the easiest way uh, to kind of frame what I was thinking was like, imagine like a, some sort of like Kaggle competition where different risk teams actually are submitting competitive model for the same, for the same kind of asset for the same purpose and yeah and, i think that's and, and, and therefore kind of like um you, you have like two um two playing uh, around and kind of like the one with the best parameters or the, the the best accuracy um that kind of like leads leads the power or something um yeah i think that's uh i think that's generally the idea right like competing risk teams i mean of yeah, competing risk teams and, and essentially the MCARE holders will ultimately decide which methodology they they want to go with, right? I don't think there's, it's, it's easy to beforehand declare which one's better, right? But essentially... Yeah, yeah no, it was not about like declaring beforehand. It was more like about the um, uh, the timeline. But uh, I think uh, Charles has, uh, has clarified that. So it should, uh, should be good. Yeah. Sounds good. <clears throat> I'm happy with that. 
Right, thanks for the question, Will. Uh, maker, you had a uh, maker man. I should clarify, there's lots of makers here. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of, my reaction to the MIPS is, given the time frame, what we're doing, we kind of just gonna have to decide whether we go with what we have. And that'll be for everybody to decide in terms of just maker voting. Um, you know, uh, I'm just reading what I wrote. Right now, I don't see external community resources going after an alternate MIP set. I know Long for Wisdom and I have kind of discussed it. We both don't literally have the time to go after it right now. We have other priorities. Um, so if someone else in the community can step up on doing an alternate MIP set, we'd like to hear from you guys and talk to you. But I just don't see it happening. So we're just going to be looking at what we have and whether we want to vote it in as a placeholder. We'll have to revisit all of these, I think. And so just be clear kind of what we're doing. And so I'm going to leave it at that. My discussion will go in the forums. We can review and revise later. So, well, that's good insight. So, Charles, can you maybe speak to um, how malleable or iterative um, the MIP sets are, and what happens if the community comes up with input, I think in the next month or something after ratification? Yeah. So, in in general, I mean, if you don't feel like you have the time to create alternative MIPS or competing MIPS rather. I mean, all the more emphasis on really putting a lot of effort into this request for comments phase and trying to make the current MIPS as widespreadly adopted as possible. Um, in the future, I mean, the MIPS framework in general is built upon iterative improvements. So, and as I mentioned, there's an entire component in MIPS zero uh, dedicated to replacement of MIPS. So there's no timeline for replacing a MIP in the future. Um, although I suppose, yeah, sorry, Maker, you can go ahead and say something. Oh, I was just gonna say, that's the whole point, right? Is just, we just look at what we have now and decide, right? We can always redo it later. And so, you know, it doesn't, it's not that critical, I guess, when I look at the scheme of what's going on. I mean, it's important, yes, but what we get in place when and how, what it means is just gonna be how we use it really. And it's, we all know we're gonna be going through these things when we finally start doing them and going, oh, we gotta change this or we should add this. One thing I was gonna suggest, cause I suggested it before, I don't like the subproposal idea. It's just, I don't think it works. And I'll make my case here is that if it's in the proposal, it should be a component, okay? If it isn't, it should be its own MIP if it can be separate. And if it doesn't have to be an account for the whole thing you're trying to describe, just stick it in there. The idea of templates for like what risk, what domain teams we have to execute MIPS, those are in templates. We just vote on them. We change the list like a vote revision. And so when you think about it from that context of the details of who and what you put in things, think about it from the sense of lists and templates of what they do and who does it. Charles, any feedback? Oh, sorry, my my cut out. Uh, I hate to say this, but Mayor, could you repeat that last sentence? Sorry, the last sentence was just uh, having the idea of having like our list of domain teams and the people who are doing these things are the positions, ideally. Uh, you just have those as kind of little templates off the side of these things. I don't, I don't, I, I'm the sub proposal and what you stick in, like who's doing what with what MIP, those are lists of things. You have stuff in the templates or the MIPs of letter lists of things that literally are just a list for who gets to do MIP zero or who's dealing with governments MIP one and, and what they're doing basically that it's uh just generally from, you know, in terms of names and domains and EPCs and like all the contracts that we're going to be dealing with uh, Oracle suppliers and who we give Oracle information to, all this kind of stuff is off to the side and template information in some of these MIPs. You know, how we change governance parameters. That's just going to be kind of a template of like what numbers we change, you know, for doing financial governance, right, and risk governance, right, that those will be they, they, they don't have to be their own MIP. They can be a template of just data within a MIP that we execute as a sequence and not specifically laid out in the MIP, just its own little list. 
Okay, I see what you mean. Um, so basically it would like serve as, I mean, there'd be less MIPs and more components with the subproposals. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that was my point on the subproposals. Is it's they're not subproposals. They're data elements to the MIP that governance then later decides what to add to and who to remove and whatever conditions they want to put on them generally, which ideally would go in the MIP itself. It reduces the number of MIPs and it puts just the details of how you these people access and operate what, how. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's really great feedback. Um, if you could like write it down and actually have it somewhere that we could iterate on, that'd be really helpful. Well, I, I kind of, that was the forum comments. I mean, just go read my forum comments. Is mostly that's, that's what I've iterated is that I felt that those alts could be grouped. I can't redo that in my piece set myself. I just don't have the time right now. So let's revisit this another time. <laughs> so yeah, maybe somebody maybe let's post a link to the forum for the for the MIPS because I'm not sure if um, it's been posted yet. And also, um, there's this there's a Rocket Chat channel for discussion on this as well. Um, so just posted a link to the uh, oh, yep. But yeah, Actually, I mean, I think I in general. Just, I was just say it. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I lost it. No, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, this is the kind of conversation that can, um, that should. I remember what I wanted to say. All I was asking was generally if there's anybody out there working on an alternate in my piece, I kind of want to know. I just don't think it's happening. So it's not going to happen, which means governance is just going to sit here and go, well, do we take what we get or no? I mean, just look at it from a governance perspective, right? I'm just sitting here as rich, just going, we're going to have to vote on these and the time frame presented and, and it'll just be done as is. And the amount of work that can be actually done to change them, it's kind of limited. You know, the people here who would work on this are kind of under different guns now, realistically. And somebody else, unless somebody else steps up, please do. I mean, maybe not quite on that note, but like, I'd be interested to hear if any of the community members like, like, even if they're not willing to like, or not, I don't have the time to make them upset themselves. I'd be interested to know if any, like, if anybody is like actively wants there to be an alternative, right? Like, basically, like, does, there, does anyone think that we need an alternative? Does, any, does everyone think the current versions are fine? Like, well, that, that's an interesting question. Maybe we can do like an informal poll. Like, and not everybody wants to jump on the mic, but do like a, a plus one maybe in the chat uh, if you've given some consideration to alternative MIPS processes. I would also be interested to hear from what this is a hard one too. That's sort of a. I'm interested in knowing what how how much of the community has a mental model of what the MIPS process is all about. I think. So I think that there's a lot of cognitive uh, overhead here, and I'm I'm unsure of how much or how well this process has been absorbed by the general ecosystem here as well. We might be getting slightly ahead of ourselves to find out whether people have already begun creating mental models of alternative MIPS processes and how many people are sort of trying to wrap their head around what the actual MIP process is. I guess. Um, is uh, one question maybe to that is like working by example, do we, do we have actually uh, already in uh, quite a significant number of um, MIPs that have been submitted that actually fits into the model or, or they are mostly still just at the template, um, template level at this point? A question for Charles, I suppose. Oh, sorry. Can you repeat that? I was just, I just wanted to say, uh, I wanted to make a slight correction on when I was talking about the domain teams that have already been ratified before. Uh, so the risk team actually never officially proposed themselves as a risk team. That was only rich uh, for the governance facilitator and the risk teams are only judged based on the general models. So I just wanted to make that correction. Sorry for that mistake. Yeah, I think that I think that's goes in line with Will's earlier question about how um, 
how new risk teams are um, are essentially evaluated based on the, the content that they're producing. And uh, I think the current structure for the MIPS risk for, for the MIPS in regards to the risk team is that um, essentially they would be proposing a general model for review by the community. Um, and really that's what gets uh, voted in as opposed to a specific risk team themselves based on the individuals. So th the idea being that um, any, uh, any discussions or, or issues with the risk parameters or methodologies um, can stem direct can stem directly from the model itself and not the uh, not the people behind it. So, if I'm not mistaken, there isn't necessarily a um, well, at least for for MIP 11, um, it would just be the general model that would be proposed. And I guess yeah, I guess the risk team would be part of the uh, domain team aspect. Sorry, I'm confused because. I'm pretty sure like the general model thing says that general models need to be submitted by like a domain risk team. Yeah, so, yeah, like, I think I, so, I think like... I confused that myself actually. <laughs> so then there's kind of like a workflow there of one then the other kind of thing. Um, am I getting it right? Like first, first you sign it yourself in as the risk team and then you submit a model. You can actually submit a model as part of not being part of the risk team. The first one. Okay. Sorry, I cut you off earlier. Well, did you have another question? Uh, no, I think they got answered. So yeah, okay. don't worry. Sorry about that. What did you say about the, the risk team not being ratified? Did we never ratify Cyrus as the interim risk team? I thought we did. I could be wrong. Yeah, that was really the only the only correction we were, we were trying to make. That no, the the current risk team was never officially ratified in as a risk team of any sort um, in the same way that Rich was. Uh, I was just posting the sidebar that I think it's interesting with respect to the MIPS here, we kind of have a one bidder auction for, you know, an MIP set. When I see the one bid auctions and the liquidations, I cringe because those are the worst ones all the way to the zero level. And we got the same kind of thing going on here at Maker. I'd love to see multiple bidders for the positions and and functions. You know, you're talking about risk, right? Governance, risk, you know, legal, whatever, you know, uh, OSM. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Like how many bidders do we have for our functions? Yeah, I agree. And that, that's where I wanted to get this general temperature of the room about the visibility on the process and, and how well it's been absorbed into the, the zeitgeist, I suppose. But, um, it, it feels like we have uh, people, uh, like engaged stakeholders that have deep insights into MIPS, some that have uh, vague insights and then others that have no insight. And so trying to get everybody up to speed at the same time is a bit of a challenge right now, I think. Um, I, I guess the question is for Charles though, right? Like how do we accelerate? Well, I, I don't know, there, there's open questions. So um, I'm, I'm hesitant to lead the conversation, particularly when we haven't addressed all of the comments in the sidebar. Mike Tote, you had some observations as well. Do you wanna talk about those? Yeah, I can, I can talk for a bit. Um, I think the biggest thing we need to keep in mind is what what are the goals with like governance process like what 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 are we trying to do um, and what's the and how do we want to do it and realizing that the MIPS process they're mainly like a perspective on how to organize ourselves socially in order to agree on things and move things to MKR holders. Um, and I guess in terms of alternatives, only either if people have alternative MIP sets, 
then that's awesome and let's see them. But besides that, kind of continuing the way we have been and slowly building up like the signaling process, um, the collateral onboarding, and you know, there's all sorts of other questions like compensation and domain teams and and all that. And I just want to say there's definitely there's definitely other ways to think about how we organize organize ourselves socially. Trust again. I'm not sure. I wasn't sure that was a question or not. Um, no, not really. <laughs> it's just it's sort of saying stuff. There's, it's just, it's a huge question. Like, how do you organize yeah. people? How do we want to organize ourselves? It's hard to, you know. Yeah, definitely. Important. And I mean, the whole, the whole, well, the main goal of this framework is to enable the community to drive the organization of governance and effectively help maintain and improve the protocol over time. And um, who knows, in 10 years, there might be a whole different framework, a whole different type of process. The point is that uh, we're really trying to kickstart um, this next step of having everything be like community driven and built from the, the roots up and all of that. So I guess what I would say is that it kind of, already is like people yeah. are organizing to some degree and people are influencing things i think for me one of the bigger questions is more how how should domain teams interface with governance and like how because like the, those people are the ones that like have all have really deep knowledge and skills on certain things and that like we we should be I think we should be leveraging that a little bit more in governance. Um, but, and then also Maker Man making a good point in the sidebar that at the end of the day, MKR holders are the ones deciding. So like all of this needs to be understood in that context. Like we can't, this process isn't gonna change that fundamental part of the nature yet, unless we like change the chief and the whole like voting structure. But that's like a huge different undertaking. Do you have any ideas for how like you would propose the domain teams working with governance or any alternative kind of frameworks? I'd be really interested to hear that. Yeah, I think I think I've sent some stuff in the past in like our working group before, but uh, I've been toying with other ideas where like each different domain, so like risk, smart contracts, and I considered govern governance as a domain in of itself. Um, having like main heads, like kind of how, kind of like how it is now, like Rich with governance and Cyrus with risk and so Mariano for smart contracts and stuff and having, having MKR holders a lot budgets to them or maybe like they bring a couple other people as on the leads too. And then those leads like distributing and contracting like other just people and their networks and they know are doing good work for smart contracts or risk and because like how I see it is like why would MKR holders like how would they know who's good at doing risk work you know like I'd much rather trust Cyrus to hire a contract someone to do some work rather than just like kind of guessing and like trying to figure it out myself yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, the valuation process or the hiring of new risk teams is going to be um, is is going to require its own fairly significant significant initiative. I don't think it will be as simple as oh, here's a MIP that just says vote in X Y Z as a Oracle team, and then that's the end of it. Um, I would I would view these MIPs as just kind of like a as a as a explanation of things that need to get done, but the actual process behind that will be uh, significantly more um, involved, I think, in a good way, right? Yeah. And yeah, I guess that's kind of, yes, yeah, sort of my point, because it's like at the end of the day, it's just like people talking to each other and trying to figure out how to do it. And also that like how we pay people 
like the way that Cyrus, I like, I have no idea how Fear the Foundation pays like this Vashesh or Primos or whatnot, but I'm guessing that might be different than like how smart contracts people work and how like rich works and like the community development stuff. Um, so it might be hard for like MKR holders to like figure out how to, like they shouldn't be compensating people the exact same way across the board. It's just like, complicated. Well, yeah, it's fantastic and complicated. And I want to try and, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to kind of put a bow on this thing if I can. But uh, to speak to that one specific issue, this is something that I've talked about in calls going back to the beginning of time, is that um, we have the foundation and then we have the community. Um, and as we become more sophisticated, the community self-organizes. And so the community we have now is nothing like the one we had like a year ago or two years ago. We have um, PR teams and we have risk teams and we have um, uh, collateral onboarding teams and people are, are self-organizing, um, which is ideal. That's, that's exactly what we need to decentralize. But this is a, uh, a long process. And once, once groups of actors self-identify or get identified by the ecosystem and then we look to fill those roles, um, the foundation has to bootstrap those things because there's no, um, there's no funding mechanism sitting around right now that we can use to allocate to the ecosystem, obviously. Um, we, uh, it's built into the protocol and it's part of the plan is to have uh, the, the buffer uh, and uh, make our stability fees are what inevitably will be funding these things. But one of the, the future steps that the community, one of the major evolutions or growth spurts that the community has to go through is how does it handle an allocation of its own budget um, to uh, fund the actors that it's identified that it needs. And that's where EPCs and domain teams come into play. Um, there's uh, working groups started just recently to clarify what the implications of that are and how they could work and all the rest of it. So there will be um, communication and uh, presentations and all kinds of things coming about how that happens because as far as I'm concerned, um, that's a major paradigm shift. Um, that's, that's when true autonomy sort of happens, I think, when um, ultimately the ecosystem needs to be able to identify its own requirements and then allocate its own resources to uh, satisfy those requirements. And that's when agency occurs. Um, it's going to be enormously important, but there's no, there's no clear uh, picture of exactly what that looks like right now, other than the fact that uh, the protocol uh, needs to be able to pay for the protocol's operation. So we'll see what that looks like soon. Um, but sorry, yeah, I feel like I, I might be uh, preemptively ending this debate, which I think is super helpful and healthy and we need to continue it. Um, so here's here's a summary. So we have uh, a MIPS process. We have MIPS0, um, which uh, is sophisticated and we have uh, that is going to launch us into uh, MIP3. And MIP3 is what the governance cycle is all about. And there's an aggressive timeline associated with this. We're at April 16th, um, May 4th, um, we begin a new governance cycle that's uh, outlined in MIP3. Um, and so the community needs to have a, an understanding of what that implies and what the responsibilities are, and how that will change things. So I, I encourage people to Assuming that the MIPS were ratified, so it's long for wisdom. So uh, I encourage people to engage with this process. So have a look at the forum thread that's been posted here. Um, uh, uh, express your feelings and your thoughts and uh, suggestions for improvement. And then uh, we'll figure out where we, where we live and what the future is going to look like. Uh, so 15 minutes left. I am going to hand this off to Vishesh. This might actually come as a surprise to Vishesh, so feel free to opt out. But do you have a state of the pegs for us to, this week? Um, sure, I can click on that. Make something up as we go. Nice. nice. Yeah, um, and it'll be quick too. So, I mean, the, the long story short is there's not been um, a significant change in uh, what's going on with the dye supply overall. Um, so, those values are, are sitting in a pretty steady state. Um, that 
dive from USDC is down to a little under a million. Um, obviously, that part makes sense, um, given the the reduced need for that at the moment and the, the higher cost. Um, in terms of the collateral portfolio, so for ETH, I mean, that's been sitting pretty constant from where it was last week. The collateralization ratios have not changed that much. Um, uh, as you can see that sort of those liquidation prices are primarily uh, 103 and um, 80. So that's still pretty constant. Um, if you look at USDC, um, take a moment to load. I'll come back to that. So um, in terms of the die trades, so what we saw um, in the last 24 hours was uh, a pretty decent chunk of the trading was actually on Uniswap. Um, so that's kind of a, a small atypical data point. Usually it's not such a large percentage for Uniswap. Um, and uh, saw a fair amount of of slippage there. The volume weighted average price for the last 24 hours is still um, at about a dollar two. So, you know, DAI is still sitting above the peg. What's interesting is in the last 24 hours as well, um, the side trades, so obviously very few of them, but they were actually trading down a bit, um, which is interesting because they, they usually track um, pretty well, Zai and DAI. So um, perhaps that's some indication that things are, are a little shaky on the side peg side of things. Um, in terms, oh, let me just see if this slide, yeah. So in terms of USCC, so obviously um, a, a large chunk of the collateral for USDC is you know close to, to that collateralization requirement. Um, because there's low perceived volatility with that. Um, though interestingly, some of those positions do maintain uh, a bit more collateral than they actually need. Um, and yeah, you can see sort of some of the individual trades um, for DAI in the last 24 hours, in the last uh, week, very similar, um, both just hovering at around $1.02 with uh, a little bit more trading in the last day or so, but all still kind of at that steady state um, above the peg. And yeah, I'll actually, I'll keep it quick today and then if people have specific questions, we can touch on that. Uh, I had, I'm not sure it's really a question, but it was sort of comments. Um, I noticed the, the the die locked in the DSR is decreasing, which is, I think, good. Um, not super quickly, but like it's still coming down gradually. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, I guess? I mean, that it was sort of weird, actually, that that was not coming down faster earlier, um, given that the rates were adjusted. So that makes total sense. The, if anything, the weird part was that it took so long. Mm. I mean, we've seen this behavior know. before, though. Like people are, th these apps are fantastically sticky for some reason. If there's some kind of threshold that I'm unclear on what it is, where people actually break out their hardware wallets and start moving things to other areas. Maybe it's the lack of better alternatives. If the DSR is yeah, I mean, it, some people or presumably the people that do use it in that way perceive it to be sort of a, a risk-free, like free parking spot you know, from the monopoly port. And so in that context, for them, the yield that's available for supplying it out on other platforms maybe um, does not justify their perceived potential risks in using those platforms. So they sort of view it as like, all right, well, I'm eating the capital cost, but from their perspective, it's a risk-free option. But yeah, I mean, the, the just yeah. mm -hmm. past week has been relatively quiet. It just not much has changed.
All right, I thought I heard somebody about to pipe up, but in case that's not going to happen, or if it does, just feel free to interrupt me, but I'm going to uh, summarize some stuff. So we had a long uh, presentation from Charles. Thank you, Charles, for that. Um, please join the forums and uh, engage with the MIPS uh, discussion. We have some uh, weighty decisions uh, that need to be taken care of very soon. Um, and there's a lot of things that we didn't address in this call. Um, that are happening right now. Uh, so many things, I'm probably not going to remember all of them. So here's a, here's a list of uh, GSM uh, needs to be understood and re reviewed. Um, mechanisms for dark fix, how do, who do we trust? How do we trust them? How do we, uh, well, there's a social layer that needs to be understood when it comes to fixing uh, problems in the protocol. Uh, there's uh, SCD shutdown. There's a topic that's worthy of conversation. Um, th th that's fairly monumental. The community has signaled that they want to do it on the 24th. Um, there's issues to be discussed here, though, and this is a topic that I'm going to revisit uh, more and more in the coming weeks, is um, the difference between intention and feasibility. Um, so we have a Sort of this, uh, we have an open source governance ecosystem where people can come in, make a proposal. P, uh, the maker holders can signal agreement or disagreement, um, but that does not make the world turn backwards. So, uh, like, if the community wants to do a thing, they can, they can say that they want that thing to happen. But there's this missing piece of the puzzle where feasibility and uh, comes into play. Like, is it possible to do that thing? How long will it take to do that thing? Who needs to do that thing? what order those things need to happen and like there's just probably a highly technical group and we've all been through this process uh in various uh our own specific domains is that you know coming up with a good idea is one thing getting a project plan and a roadmap and implementation and all the rest of those fun things is quite another um so to loop this back to what i was just talking about uh we can the community signal they want to shut down the 24th but uh, we all have to understand what does that actually mean? Um, and well, how does that work? And how are we going to tell people about it? And does the rest of the ecosystem know that this thing is coming? So uh, there's lots of conversations that need to be had around this thing. So if you have a uh, interest in a uh, single collateral die and it's uh, eminent demise, please join the forums as well and, and get engaged with that discussion. I think I'm, I'm probably going to leave it there. So can I, I just want to say a couple things before you end the call. Uh, so sure. just want to let people know that on Tuesday and Wednesday, um, the risk team gave a couple of additional, uh, we held additional governance calls. Um, encourage everyone to check out the recordings um, where we discuss some collateral risk modeling type of stuff. Um, question from Will about if we're going to continue these risk calls like last week, uh, as of right now, I think we will. I think we're gonna try to continue doing some additional ones um, outside of this regular Thursday circuit. Um, but I, we haven't quite locked down details on um, times and dates and all that stuff. But yeah, in general, I think. We yeah. Might. Awesome. Um, yeah, I just uh, yeah, I just regretted that actually I missed those uh, those calls from last week. Were the the ones that I was the, I was the most interested uh, to to be at. Yeah, um, sorry about that. Little while. But that, but that's all good. It's just that um, I, uh, I I was just um, yeah locked on the on the tags of uh, governance uh, meetings and um, and that was kind of like uh, published somewhere else. Therefore, I didn't get the notification. But it's all good. Just um, just wanted to know whether um, you're going to be doing an ongoing uh, kind of like a risk, uh, like data focused kind of call um, in the future. All right, cool. Thanks, Eric, for that clarity. Um, we can look forward to that. I think that there's a yeah, lot to absorb. So let me just summarize. Uh, join the forums. Uh, that's where governance is happening, and that's where your voice can be heard. That's where the community creates the uh, consensus, the social layer um, that the, the maker holders large, by and large uh, follow. So uh, if you want to fix the protocol, make it better, improve it, alter it, that's the place to do it. So please join us. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, really interesting call. Talk to you next week.